Today on the Realism Podcast, we are delighted to welcome George Heaton, co-founder of Represent Clothing, a multi-million pound fashion company based in England. In the upcoming podcast, we discuss how the brand was formed, from where they draw inspiration, the biggest challenges so far, and the mindset required to grow a brand in a very saturated market. We hope you enjoy. your story tell us how you started representing where the inspiration for the brand come from so i was 19 years old just finishing college it was actually the final major project that i was doing i wanted to make a clothing brand i wanted to basically put my art on t-shirts and that led to a lot of other things later on down the line um at the time i was like looking at streetwear brands as it was a big like boom of obey um diamond supply and stuff like that and I was just looking at how them them owners were living and how the designers were working and that's what that's what I wanted my future to be mm-hmm. and uh, you studied graphic design I believe in college and university yeah correct and your biggest inspiration for the brand in terms of uh, you mentioned those brands there but is there yeah. anything else that inspired you I mean to- yeah outside of fashion it's got to be Rolls Royce I mean I love the elegance and the road presence and just the whole manufacturing system they have and just the the, the way they've stuck to the roots mm-hmm. as such and I, I just love that and I love playing on different things that they use for my own brand. Okay and what were the first steps to get the brand going so obviously you mentioned putting your art onto a t-shirt so yeah what was the process in terms of finding the t-shirts or finding the so, for the t-shirts etc. I mean at the start it was just it was finding Gildan t-shirts and finding merch printers and there was one down in Cardiff that I was using it as they, they printed me fat yeah they printed me 25 <laughs> <It's cheap. laughs> I think it was like four quid all in they printed me t-shirts 25 as a run and then 50 as a run and I'd sell the labels in at home as you know how it works and um yeah just flogged them to friends we had a big cartel site and friends of friends and then it, it just it, it kind of grew from there the first two or three years was a complete blur because I was at university and there was other things going on. The brand had a completely different identity to what it does now. It was a yeah, lot that's... more affordable then. So it, yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it's, I always call it a constant progression and mm-hmm. it's grown up with me as a designer. I'm with my brother as a designer I can see that. and just how we've matured as we've got, as we, as we have aged, um, the brand has grown with us and it's, it's only it's like eight years in now. We're only just at that point where we're like yeah. really satisfied with it, and we absolutely love everything that we're doing. Yeah, I can see that. And um, I think when MDV was formed, I remember Represent was born a few months, few, yeah, few yeah, yeah. years earlier, and that streetwear vibe was what exactly what MDV was formed on. And obviously, Represent was, you know, had a, a good start in that field, and it was almost like affordable streetwear then. And now it's more, I think what you touched on Rolls Royce, luxury streetwear. Mm. I think that's easy to see from afar that you've translated in your design skill set and your brother's skill set. It's completely evolved and from details to f- fabrics to trims, it's it's gone to the next level now and so is the price point. <laughs> yeah, it has. Well, the, I, I'm, I'm hitting them luxury points, like you say, the details, the fabrics, the trims, the fits, the factories, I'm making sure everything's made in the right yeah. places. But I still try and keep that price point at a, like a mid tier as such, uh-huh. so I can target the people who have bought it from day one. I mean, the customers grown up with us, of course. so their spending has obviously gone up as they've progressed, as well as the quality of the garments. And I try to, I just try to make sure that everyone can obtain represent. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you know, your brand as well. I know compared to most brands, is not made in you know Asia. Is it? It's made. It's not. No, most of it's in Italy here. Or so the quality is a lot better. I mean, you can get quality everywhere in the world. You, I'm, I'm sure you know. Ch- like China can stitch way better than the UK. Mm. Yeah. But it's uh, for it's me. Perception, it's, isn't it? it's perception. Yeah, it is. It is a perception, and a lot of factories do actually outsource anyway. But for me, it's just having it 
close to home and I like the British made aspects of it and I like going down to the factories or flying an hour to go and see how the footwear production is coming on. Did you, do you think do you think that harmed you in any way? Because originally you did, did you start, you started out of China? Almost? Yeah, I mean, I was doing a few things in China. I was doing like the jeans in China and then some accessories and stuff. Um, but I always, I wanted to make in England from the start. I just couldn't afford it at the time. Okay. And you mentioned in year two and three, that was a start and it was almost a blur. And I remember in year four and five, I think if that was 2015 and 16, I'm going to say, yeah. you was on fire. You had yeah. the jeans, which were on fire, the footwear, which was on fire, pricing, the perception of the brand was on absolute fire. So what would you attribute that down to? Um, I guess everything's a learning curve. And at that point, we weren't taking on wholesale accounts. We weren't looking elsewhere. We were just... I suppose we were just making products, buying them at a cost and selling them at a cost that we thought was reasonable and it really hit in the right market at the right time and that's what propelled us into being able to be where we're at now. I agree. And timing is key, isn't it? And I think timing is key, definitely. Denim was really taking a, a foothold in the game and I think it's fair to say it represents Jeans were, were, were probably one of the best in the market at the time. Yeah, I mean, they became a thing, like... They didn't require any marketing budget, didn't require any spends on ads, nothing. They were just selling it all day, every day. I think like our essential black denim is just, I don't even know how many users are sold over the time, but it still sells today. And I guess in 2020, denim is not as prominent. It's picking back up, it's not as prominent as it was in 2016. So how did you adjust when the denim volume was decreasing? We brought in new silhouettes, new, new styles, new pants, new like, the cargo pant kind of took over denim for the past few years and obviously we had to adapt to that but we still stayed true to our denim stayed true to our fit and just kind of adapted that and maybe just elaborated it on more and used it more in campaigns and tried to bring it back from like i don't know like it, it's hard to say because denim denim hasn't gone down it's not like a it's not like a, a decreased market it's just that other markets have increased. Other, other markets yeah. have increased, and the, I guess the streetwear market isn't such a denim-based thing anymore. Yeah, I think that the silhouette that you had was the the tapered jeans, not fitted, tapered jeans, specifically towards the ankle, yeah. a loose-fit hoodie, and a staple trainer. And I think that looks changed, but you had that look in 2016. That was the represent look, was it? Yeah, of course, it? yeah. It became a thing. I just that, that look all came about from... I was actually, I had a pair of cheap Monday jeans and they would, they were always like too baggy around the ankle, always, mm -hmm. but skinny up top and I couldn't find any jeans that would just do that taper and have it a bit longer than usual. So I took them to my grandma's and she adjusted them for me and that, that's what we sent off to get the shape right and it's still the same shape ever since. And you mentioned, uh, when I mentioned about the, you know, the domination in 2015 and 16 and you said that you didn't have wholesale accounts and... Was, do you think do you think the focus primarily on just making sure that the products and you mentioned cost price and retail price were optimized for you as a consumer based on your finances at that point what you were willing to pay? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, when you, getting wholesale accounts is a is a really difficult thing to do when you're coming from a direct to consumer mm -hmm. brand because your retail price point is is based on a percentage profit from what you're actually purchasing at. Whereas when, when you come into wholesale, you've got to give that store a markup of this amount. Whereas actually when you're selling it online, that was the markup you were doing anyway. So, you have to so then you have to increase your retail mm -hmm. prices and your customer doesn't like that. And it gets, a, it, especially for me, it got very tricky. It was a very tricky few years. And what do you think of that now in today's market? If you could turn back time, would you, would you keep wholesale? Would you change wholesale? What, what would you do? No, I wouldn't take back time because I think everything, I do everything for a reason and the whole brand image is perceived all over the world in stores and in some of the best stores in the world and I, I do love that fact about it. I mean, I guess, that, yeah. We live, in a, we live in a world where everything is online. Everything is online. So even if you're not making money on having that product in specific areas and having it on display and for people to touch it and understand the actual product and the meaning behind the product it is an addition mm -hmm. 
the unit or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I forgot what it was, but I can ask about your stores. So you, you did you did stores, didn't you, for one or pop ups? I do pop yeah, we always still do, do pop ups. Yeah, we yeah, always yeah. do temporary stores and just installations around the world, even if it's in department stores or in stores that sell our brand just so we can meet the customer and Is that the only reason to meet the customer and to showcase the product in feel? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what it's for, is to feel the product and understand the product and understand the brand. Do you think they're going well? What as as the pop up stores? Are you going to continue to do? Oh are yeah, we we'll always well? do. Are you we, getting loads of feedback? Yeah, we do. We do do maybe like four or five pop ups a year, but that many wow. Yeah, they're just small ones. They're in stores installations, really. Is that so? We're like we've got one coming up with Harvey Nichols. We've got one coming up with Mister Porter. We're doing some other things around the world. Do do one in Australia this year. Um, one in London in the next few weeks. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just good to have that connection with your customers as well. Do you think anyone that has a fashion brand or has a brand should do pop-ups? Do you think it's a thing that yeah, definitely, should do? definitely. If you're a direct consumer brand, I think communicating with that customer on a personal level is best for a pop-up yeah, store. Definitely. Do you take emails and and stuff like that when you're there? No, I don't. I don't do any kind of marketing when I'm there, but I do like to speak to the customers and understand what they like and what other brands they're into and what 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 their wardrobes look like i like to just see what people are wearing and stand yeah what who our market actually is because you don't actually know your market unless yeah. you get involved with it yeah i can imagine they come and bring loads of outfits and get you to style them as well when they're there. <laughs> people do that no no <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> so just going back to something you said about you know the brand is an evolution of the owners and i totally agree with that and um it's evidently to see from you know when he was in college and university and had no money to you know the success that you had in the first five years of business which was unbelievable that of course your you and your brother's lifestyle completely changed and you said earlier before that that you looked up to these uh, the obey brand owners etc and their lifestyle do you think that in the last two or three years due to your increase in lifestyle that the quality fabrics everything has improved but so is the, the retail price and the cost price of that product. Do you think that that's potentially isolated some of the core represent fans from the earlier days? I do, yeah. It, um, but I do believe in progress and moving on. And I think if, look, my prices are still obtainable. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm offering something that is at a level that shouldn't be as obtainable as it is, in my opinion. So I feel like I'm giving luxury for fair value, for fair, mm -hmm. fair value, and whether people like that or not, it, or they drop off the brand because the prices are too high. Mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't really matter because we we've, we've built a, a very strong following that mm -hmm. will stay true to the brand mm -hmm. because of that. So in your mentality, is that progression at all cost in terms of you and your brother's vision for the brand, rather than almost a business aspect? Um, Would you? make sure that the brand and the quality and the, the details and fabrics keep going that one step every every year i like to say that we don't invent the wheel but we'd like to refine ourselves so it's kind of got to a point in the past 12 months where we really love the shapes and the products that we're doing and the quality it's at whereas i want to now keep it at a level that has okay. has that ability to grow in terms of in terms of the look but not specifically in terms of the price so i guess you've kind of let's say you've fixed the level of let's say the standard of, of yeah the product is yeah i think it's taken yeah it's, i think it's taken me eight years but it's at that level now where i want it to remain i agree i agree i think that's the most important thing i think as an owner you need to set the standpoint of where you want your brand to go and people have to kind of follow whether they like it or not and i think for longevity purposes I think the way you've gone with it anyway is gonna. Everyone's kind of gonna thank you in the long run because we see a lot of fads these days. They go up, they cheap, cheapen their prices, yeah. and then it's just a big downhill slope. Yeah, of course. And I, for for me personally, because the brand is very personal to me and my brother, awesome. and like I, I, in the first few years, I would buy a lot more expensive brands and wear them over my brand, and it. I I didn't like it. I didn't like myself for doing it. So I wanted to make sure my brand was at a level where you can buy it but it's ob obtainable and it still feels as good as them top brands. I agree. And now all I, all I wear is represent, so I've got it to the right point. So I guess now it's just a case of on a business aspect, 
maintain that quality, but making sure that you can reduce the cost prices. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, in effect, maybe just treat the retail prices 10, 20 percent. So yeah, you you don't make more money, but everyone reaps the benefit basically. Yeah, exactly. And I'm I'm from a design background. I'm not a businessman. Like I speak to you a lot because you really you're you're more business orientated and you understand that kind of thing a lot. So I'm I'm learning from you that maybe sometimes I push the boat out too far and sometimes it's not the right thing to do from a business point. So I need to kind of bring down the creative standpoint and bring up the business standpoint and meet at a level where it's perfect. Yeah, I don't, I don't even think it's a case of you dropping that creative standpoint. I think you're, you're creative. And I, or I said to Lewis often, I'm like, as a creative, he's one of the best that I've seen. I think it's a case of maintaining that and then Bringing reducing the, of- the business. Yeah, Yeah, so I don't think you have to reduce the creativity. It's just... Reducing the, the, you mean bring the cost up. price? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's not reducing the creativity, but it's more of me just learning and understanding other sides of the business. Yeah. And that takes time and experience. Yeah, of course. And failures, as we've all experienced uh, individually and collectively, is uh, that without those failures, you can't ever learn from them because you don't know. We simply don't know. We can't. We don't have anyone to tell us, oh, don't do that, don't do this. And mm, that's, that's the thing. That's like, the thing. you hear a lot of people having mentors and people who have been in it before, but we're kind of in a new age era where Correct. you can't have a mentor that's done the same thing that you've done because wasn't there wasn't, there, there social wasn't media, around. Correct. So, social so media who wasn't you, there. So who do you go to to ask for opinion and advice? Mm. It's just, it's just you know, people are around our, our range, mm. isn't it? Exactly. We've just started a brand within the last 10 years and learned themselves, really. I mean, I think there's some business fundamentals which you can be taught and or read about, etc. but when it comes to the equilibrium of e-commerce, uh, selling online logistically and then dealing with the Middle East or in, in your case Europe and making that all work in, in sync is really really hard and I think lessons in connecting dots is what yeah. what makes that difference you mentioned uh, about the creativity so where does your how do you consistently you said about leading how do you consistently lead where do you draw your inspiration from to create your products we like to look within to actually express ourselves and, and again that's another thing that took years and years of like We'd sit and research other brands and what other things are doing, but now we don't look at that. We look at like where we come from, who we are, like the the history of Britain and what what's been great about the actual country. And I like to use that as a base for our graphic design and and our fabrics as well. I like to use British fabrics and just emphasise that we're a British brand in this worldwide market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you do that really well. I think it's clear to see that. Everything you do is, is, is tailored around being British. That's nice one. <laughs> yeah, no, he does do that well. One hundred percent, the brand, a million percent represents Great Britain. You can clearly see that from the, the, uh, the tartans. Is that what they call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah stuff yeah, like you Scottish use. Tartans, yeah, everything you use. Mohairs and like. You even put England in your top in your logo, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like to put us. Put, just just put that little bit of like there's not really anyone else doing it especially in our market there's no british there's, there's no no, no one really brands, like no one hailing for britain i suppose no no, no, no. no one's doing it so yeah. so i would say from your recent collections you've got your, your flannels and your players which are, seem your staples then you've got your streetwear inspiration i know you mentioned to me your brother comes up with some crazy graphics all the time so where do you draw the inspiration from that because the the heritage in terms of the flannels etc is, is is almost self-explanatory yeah because it's you know typical Britain but the streetwear graphics and where do you get that inspiration from I guess that we, we do you know what we didn't actually do graphics until maybe a year ago and it works right it, it really when you worked. say graphics you mean graphics on t-shirts yeah I mean actual things, yeah. graphic design and they're on, really good as well yeah. and the re- yeah this is all Mike by the way <laughs> um what I'll do is I'll just plan out like a little bit of an inspiration board that that show like what well, like most of our graphics are revolve, revolve around like bull terriers and mm-hmm. and like which is british too yeah, yeah true british aspects i love rolls royce i love british manufacturing and that all comes together i love like car race and everything like that that all could there's so much you can look into graphic wise and words wise and slogan wise and just just image wise that is to do with those few subjects and there's a million subjects out there so if you want to go and base a collection on something else you you can pull from anywhere and that's just how it starts. Yeah, I think that the balance is really good at, at present. If we go back a year ago, 18 months ago, when you did the catwalks and we can yeah. talk about that. If, from my opinion, uh, I think because you went to the catwalk, 
you knew you had to make several different types of look to make sure the catwalk didn't look like one dimensional. Yeah. Do you think that that was the right decision or what's your views on that? Um, I don't regret it, but it wasn't the right step for the brand at the time. I was trying to jump too high mm -hmm. at the time and I, I didn't understand that my market is not interested in something that I, I was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of good things that come with it. There's a lot of stores that signed up to the brand and a lot of a lot of great press, but we wasn't portraying the right message as such. If if I did it again now, I could do it much easier. Mm -hmm. But like I, I make staples, I make essentials, I make just great clothes that can be worn every day by every right. man. Like and that's not what people want to see on a catwalk. So it's not really yeah. it's not really something we should be doing. So do you think that was just a case of going away from your identity of who, who the brand is and what you you and Mike are to to kind of, you believe that that's the what other people want? Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. We, we got told that that was the way forward and it seems like the way forward and it seems like the way that most brands worked like that. And that's high-end so brands. So we did you. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we did that, but we didn't, we were too young and too early to actually give it everything that we could. It's costly and, as well, isn't it? Yeah, of, it, it, of course, true. yeah. Like, even then, like, we, we were too young as a brand and as a, as a brand as such and it, yeah, it didn't, it wasn't how much? Best. How much were they, how much were they costing you these catwalks per one? Um, like, 150, 160,000 all in. Okay, pounds. Yeah, just to do the catwalk and you... Just to do a, a runway show where, like, you don't see any return on that because yeah. it's not putting your product online and the stuff's then getting seen where six months later it's just dropping online. And people that's forget it as well. Yeah, people within that people time, forget. people are copying it. Within that time, people are people get bored of it. Like they've mm -hmm. seen it now. They're, and then they're on to the next catwalk. That's There's another true. one on 10 that's minutes true. later and yours is forgotten about. Yeah, the press comes out, that's great. But six months later down the line, you're releasing that product. It's been seen. Mm -hmm. Like it's not... A, do you, think that's, do you think that's due to social media and uh, the way we are in today? We, it is, look, yeah. Of course it is. I mean, anyone can go to a catwalk now and anyone can post about it. So the message is getting out there, great. But if that product is not available to buy, your brand isn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's great. great. Oh, I agree. Right now. People, do, people want it right, right now. now. Yeah. Uh, and and if I've you wait said six it, months, forget about yeah, it. Yeah, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think that if you can do a see now, buy now runway, that'd be a lot better. Burberry yeah, has done yeah, that, yeah. haven't they? Have they? I didn't know. That, yeah. But you've got to be some size to be able to actually have the product ready and be able to wholesale it at the same time. I agree. And from my opinion, actually, the catwalks that you did were great. I thought that the, the, the difference... The, 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 um, again. <laughs> the, um, the balance of the cat, the balance of the, the looks was great, but I know from a business standpoint that that would... I knew when you did that, that was gonna, you was going to suffer from that. Yeah. And we, your customer isn't ready for it. And uh, we we went we went to Bond Street today. We went to the Dior, and we saw a look on the a mannequin. It was you know a straight leg, white uh, tailored trouser, white bomber shirt tucked in, and it looked the business. And we both said that looks incredible. But if we made that, it wouldn't yeah, sell. It wouldn't work I think that's us. what it comes down to. Yeah, and I suppose is that an ego thing that like you'd want to make stuff that looks cool and looks great on a Absolutely. runway, and then the reality of it is it doesn't actually work for you. Absolutely. And I guess it's just learning that everything's a learning curve, man. Mm. I like think we yeah. learn from it all. And you want to make what you will want to you will want to make, and I do too. Sometimes <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. I can make it, but when it comes out, I can't wait to go to the warehouse and get it. But yeah. the customer don't feel the same way. And I think those are the dots that you have to almost continuously connect and go, okay, well, why why are people not wearing it? Because they they don't have maybe the confidence or the disposable income that you may have, or I may have, or Lewis may have to go and get it. So you've got to. Fit, fit that bridge at making stuff in a silhouette which is like yeah and I, and, and I think you put them fundamentals together that um that that you touch on to make a product that you know is going to work then it will work look like i do it with a shoe i need to make sure that the sole is a certain depth right. and the colorway has to be this on the sole but then this on the on the body of it and the tongue has to have this on it and you can't go too crazy on this or the stitch detail has to be like this. The toe and box has to look The good. toe box has to be sloping and there's all these things that go together that make a product work and then when it goes on your website, it goes into the store, then 
you know it's going to do well and it does you know you know you know before the product goes online what's good what's going to do well you know it yourself yeah so when you create a product now you mentioned about all those variables now do you have like almost a i, I create a checklist for when i create a product now yeah so do you have that's like a good a idea process of um why you why why you're putting that element on that silhouette or why using that silhouette or why using that color what what goes through your mind when you're creating anything well 50 percent of it is instinct so that's like if i like it if my brother likes it if the fabric colorways are fit into the collection and fit into the brand and we know them colorways work and we know this silhouette works then the rest of it is just the smaller details that impact the the final purchase i guess that's true yeah i i personally i i go is the silhouette wearable is the color acceptable um is it available elsewhere yeah um are the details going to be appreciated by the customer because you know you can put crazy details and you know these immense stitch lines and yeah. fab fabrics in the back pocket and no one cares and the customer doesn't want to carry that cost so you've got to kind of break down is someone willing to pay for this detail yeah there's so many elements to it and you can get lost in it when you yeah. when you're actually creating it and you're creating a full collection it's it's hard to keep track of everything but when you get it right i guess you can you can use that in the future to to keep building on that yeah because you see it as an art ultimately so you want to make every a square inch of the bloody product sensational and it's it's uh sometimes you pay the price on the other side when people don't really appreciate the same level of care that you put into the product yeah exactly what do you think the hardest point uh, of growing and scaling after five years is what, what do you think the, the toughest situations you've you've came with? um the toughest situation for me is taking on wholesalers and being in them stores and realizing profit percentages aren't what they seem to be um, compared to a direct to consumer where you can scale and keep them profits high that that's been that's been a hard thing to overcome because that to, for, for me that means completely moving all my production and uh, entering bigger factories and lower cost factories to be able, and really getting down to the finer details of cost down to the nearest pence just so we can actually still grow from that element so would you say that's like a more operational, basically the business back end of it now, it's, it's, it becomes quite difficult. It does, yeah, and it requires a lot more people and doesn't make us anywhere near as much as a direct-to-consumer basis, but got to do it. So how do you plan to solve those operational issues? Um, I've already planned them and solved them. Okay, how do you and solve it, them? It's just, yeah, like I said, it's moving factories, it's working down prices and just, just being... I suppose designing so far ahead that you can bring the collection in way before it goes to market and make sure the pieces that you're taking are the right things and are the things that are going to make you money and kind of learning what the stores are actually selling. Okay. So then that collection that goes to market is a lot more condensed and a lot easier to sell, I guess, um, so more compared to what goes online. Yeah. More mass market. And how do the buyers for these wholesale? What's their criteria? How do you know when they're going to love a collection or what, from your experience, what's made them something that you've made that thought you thought was amazing and some said I don't want that. So I've never done wholesale personally, yeah. so I don't have any experience. So what's, what, what's, I the suppose situation? it's kind of like a nervous thing when you go to the, the showrooms and you display in your collection for people to come around and buy for their stores and you never get everything right. Mm. Like, no, no brands get everything right. The amount of product I see that never actually makes it to market is is crazy, and it's the same with us. Like st stores know what they want. Their buyers are briefed on what to buy, and they have data, and they know what sells well. And every single territory is different. Every single country is different. Mm. So, mm. like a store from this side of the world will buy all this part of the collection, but a store from this side of the world won't touch that. Okay. So it's it's it is kind of like all over the place, and you've got to cater to everything. So do you think the trick would be to, you know, let's say if you're presenting in Paris or you're presenting in, you went to Tokyo or somewhere? Um, I do Paris and Milan. Paris and Milan. Yeah. So I'm assuming Italy and France have different ways of viewing things. So is the trick as a brand owner knowing what that country wants and showing them what they, what you think they want to see? The thing is, the buyers come from all over the world. Right. And like I said, they're all specific to what their customer wants. Okay. It's not necessarily your customer, it's their class that has their customer. So 
you've still got to display a full collection and make sure you're hitting every product base on there. Like I'm a lot stronger on my denim and jersey than I am on my outerwear and footwear. Um, but that's that's just how the brand has been built and I'm building them footwear collections and I'm building the outerwear collections to try and bring up to that same spec. But I don't really know what else there is about it. You had your dust boot on the point of footwear. Was it the dust boot, which was a big yeah. hit, right? Yeah. 2000 and when was that? 16. Yeah, Honestly, it was the banger. 16, you had a, you had a banger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was one of your best products, I think, for sure. I think it just hit at the perfect time and like, it was the Yeezy season was the Yeezy. collection yeah, releasing yeah, yeah. and Fear so, of God was putting out things God. and we were so just like, and we'd already done this mm. this shoe and was like, fuck it, let's put it out there mm. and it just went crazy and we couldn't get it made fast enough and then we couldn't sell it to the stores fast enough and after like, it, it was weird, it had a, it had a, it went like this, like we'd sold 900 in the first night, mm. I was like, right, make some more, make some more, make some more colorways and then one day it just stopped. Mm. I think that comes Which down is to strange. consumers. I've never, yeah. Yeah. consumers. I remember seeing Alexander McQueen, the, the exaggerated soul sneakers, absolutely years ago. And I was going to buy them and I didn't buy them. Cause yeah. I, thought, I think at, the, at this time I cared more about what people would say now. And now you can't go down the street without seeing Well, I them. think it's the best selling sneaker yeah, in right. every department store in the world. But that's the time I think because it, all it took was one major person to wear them and the whole world followed. And then now we'd see a chunky soul. Who, Everyone who looks, was that? I, th I can't. It might have been ASAP Rocky, some someone like that. And uh, now everybody doesn't buy a sole unless it's chunky. And then it would be funny, you know. It might be a triangular sole soon. I don't know what yeah, it is. Yeah, but yeah, once someone it. wears it, then it makes. It make, if you made a product, it makes it acceptable. But someone, and it normally is one of the really, really big brands, has to lead the way and, yeah, make it, and have mass adoption. And I'm sure then big brands are constantly testing the market with what to do with what that next actual sole or that next thing is that's going to create a trend that. They're they're the like the pinpoint of, yeah. and I guess that's like an actual, that's like a huge milestone for a brand to be able to do that, like McQueen with that shoe, or like Lentz 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 with the Triple S, S, or yeah, it's yeah. not even that, yeah. And they make it's, it more acceptable for consumers. So your price point is more consumer led than, let's say, Balenciaga at seven hundred pound trainer. So once they've ad adopted a knitted upper with a a kind of comfort luxury. Yeah. Then you can do the terrier for argument's sake, and the terrier is a kind of like hybrid where it's comfortable, sporty, but luxury at the same time. Yeah, that makes that acceptable. Whereas if you was the innovator, because you want, haven't got fifty years of heritage behind you, it it's very yeah. difficult for you to be that innovator, isn't it? And be that pinpoint of where it all starts. Yeah, I guess so. And that's timing is is key. You, it's sometimes being the 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 leader is almost the worst place because. You've got to get the visibility to be the leader. It's all well and good having one or two people wearing it, but these big brands, as you know, LVMH, they can they can make a trend and get it on the most influential people in the world. Yeah. And before you know it, the whole world follows. And I think that's key is timing, isn't it? Timing is everything, yeah. Do you, do you think there's any way to manipulate a trend? Um, I, I think you can take your brand's spin on a trend and create a new trend out of that. Um, so I suppose that's manipulation and we do that, every brand does that, like if something is in trend, if you can put your brand's DNA into that trend and create something that then can go out to the go out to the world, then yeah, you that's yeah, yeah. if you've got an example of great from that recently. Um I suppose that's what the terrier is, like you said, the sock like a sock sneaker was like a thing and then how do you then elevate that to the next level? Yeah. We put like a cage around it and mix the like luxury suede with some breathable nylon so that the actual air can get through to the sock. And then there's a lacing system, which isn't actually useful, but it just looks good okay. and add the chunkies to sole onto that. And you, ha you have like a hybrid shoe, I guess. Yeah, it, it's You're hitting hot. both angles of that chunky sneaker trend and the sock yeah, yeah. trend. And bringing it into one. It's like that Versace sneak, you know, that Versace sneaker with the big chunky sole. It yeah, reminds yeah. me of that compared and then merged into the Bassaint sock. So, Bassaint sock, the Bassaint um, <laughs> sock, the um, Alenti Argus sure, sock. I sure. I guess you've done that with your latest, well, upcoming shoe with the Dunk. Dunk has come back round 360 as it always does. It goes quiet for five years and you can't get enough fit. And your shoe, mistake me if I'm wrong, is inspired by a Dunk type of. Uh, silhouette with obviously yeah. a thicker sole yeah again again it's the same i've done the same thing as i did with the terrier i took 
little aspects from the Jordan one and I took little aspects from the Rick Owens dunk yeah. and I, I kind of mixed them up and then put my own like I don't I, I love wearing Jordan ones but I don't like getting my foot in and out of them so I made sure that we had lower sides so you can easily slip your foot in and out and I put like an elastic thing into the tongue so the tongue wouldn't move yeah. and just just switched everything up and kind of used a similar sole but then increased the height of it just so it's more in line with my brand DNA and slopes that tongue more and then changed up the colorways and kind of added like this rep detailing on the side yeah, and that's and and it just looks in my own in my opinion obviously very unique but I think it's something that'll stay within the brand for a while so I know you have a, a quote which I know the quote to take the best to make it better right exactly from Henry Royce yeah and uh, I think that's I think that's the, yeah. the trick to entrepreneurship you see what is out there you see where it's flawed and you make it significantly better mm -hmm. and, and obviously keep the price in line and that is the most simple way to be successful but also the hardest thing to recognize because you don't know you don't know why it's the best and we touched on earlier about the variables and let's say a bestseller has seven to ten variables which you must tick to make yeah. it work yeah i think this the key is to understand why it works you mentioned those factors in the the, the sole and in terms of the dunk and the the Jordan one that the, you can't get your foot in, the soul moves. Yeah. Like you've had the, the skill set to identify those things because most people don't know what they're doing. Like they might may think this is hard to get on, but they're not signaling back to the brain. Yeah. Oh, it's actually hard to get on. Or the tongue's moving. They're not thinking, oh, we could fix this. And yeah. That's the biggest skill. Like, yeah, I suppose it's kind of like innovation to a, to a degree, but innovation on a very short level that can that's just everyday things just how you can make it better and make it easier than adding so so you add that element into your design element and the fundamentals and then you get the product that ergonomic engineering yeah i guess it is isn't that's it? what it is pretty much well car designers do that very frequently don't they I mean, yeah what was what's the, like mercedes has been unbelievable with it the i think audi had the audi a5 which at the time was quite you know sleek and the coupe-esque and then Mercedes took that obviously with the C-Class and made the C-Class like for 30 grand it's one hell of a car do you know what I mean it looks, yeah. it looks the business and then they transform that sleekness into every model and then no one can touch them and they, they almost leave I'm, the I'm convinced with car manufacturers though they just don't they just keep everything so like slowly progressive like again why is that because the consumers aren't ready for it correct and if we look at Elon Musk in the situation with that Cybertruck him pushing the boat out, being the innovator, him being, you know, our, well, it's one of the biggest car companies in the world now based in stock market. Him being the innovator is going to allow Porsche, Mercedes, etc. to so push, push up push the boat. Mm -hmm. Because someone's seen it now, the human, people have seen it. And it's just the same it. element as the Balenciaga sock. Yeah, someone someone has to create something that actually changes people's thoughts on design. And makes it acceptable. Just makes like it acceptable. And then the world, I guess the world follows, doesn't it? Yeah, the, well, humans are sheep. Generally, we not not many of us are leaders. We are mostly followers. So, to you have to follow someone who makes it acceptable, and it's the same in every design aspect. Even with phones, you know, when when Apple removed the the button, and people like, oh, move the button now. Yeah. If you had a button, they're like, I don't want the button. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And then every other like Samsung removes their button. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like someone has to lead, and sometimes that leader often fails because the world's just not ready for it. And then the yeah, the world's not ready for it. Or or they took it too far and then everyone else dimmed it down and that's what actually the main consumer will buy. Yeah. So what would you say in 2020, what's the plans for Represent? Um, well, I've just finished my fall winter wholesale, which, yeah, we closed the books yesterday and it's like done crazy compared to usual, brought on a ton of new stores, which I'm really excited about, like Browns and Mr. Porter and some others. Um, we're currently designing spring summer 21 which is, looks really good but i don't know I've, I've i've planned a lot for this year and i've kind of tried to add them business elements in that you've been talking to me about and as i say teaching me about and putting everything together i think it's going to be a really good year and you, you said 2021 which is a hell of a long way yeah. away, away. so how is it working so far ahead is is uh, you've got to again i guess almost predict the trend or lead the trend which it's quite a long way well, yeah it's but, a long way now. but like going back to before when you've got your fundamentals and you know what your consumer wants then you're just working on them shapes but you're making them 
more acceptable in the summer, whereas usually they're in the winter or you put in a new palette in there that you think is going to come around or you have in mind for the whole collection. And, and it's just tweaking and perfecting things, I guess. So you say as a brand to give people advice, stay true to your identity at all times. Yeah, that's, that's the, the biggest thing because if you're chopping and changing and switching lanes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you a lot more and it's going gonna, it's gonna to deter you away from actually having that core fan base, which is the majority of your customers and, and what's driving the impact. And why do you think people often switch and change? And because of trends and because of what they think they see. Like even on social media, people will look at some a brand or a person and say, "Shit, that they they're doing really well with this product." When in the back end, they might actually not be doing really well. It just looks like it is, yeah. and they'll jump in that line and they'll go and make that product and they'll spend hundreds of thousands on de- on developing it and putting it out there and it doesn't work for them and then they're really f- further behind than they were before they even saw that product and there's there's so many points to it that it's I think if, I think this day and age as well you've got to be really personal with your brand I think that's that having that touch and having that even just having a person behind the brand that the customers know about mm. is a really big impact on someone actually checking out and wearing your clothes and actually wanting to represent your brand. Yeah, I think so. I think it, it, it invokes trust. You know, if your personality is always, you know, stay true to who you are, your customers pick up on that. If your if your style is consistently changing dramatically or your your ideas are consistently changing, no one trusts your brand. Yeah, you know, exactly. What direction is this guy going down? Mm-hmm. Do you think people change their mind in terms of, is because they always want to be reactive? Social media has got people reactive that I think the element of my personal opinion my element of timeless is completely gone now I don't think people think that long term I like to like make products that can sit online for 12 months and still look as yeah. good as they did from when they came out I always say if we've missed a trend then we try and react to the trend we're already too late and I think a lot of brands starting now they look and, and you mentioned at the start and I did the same at the start you're looking at every other brand you think we need to do that we need to do that instead of just focusing on what you're Which, good at yeah and it's natural well. for the human to do that and there's no problem with doing that, but when you're actually building a brand, you've got to have um, a, a reason and a meaning behind the brand. Mm-hmm. It's like, what do you stand for? That's what that's what your brand is. So run with that. Okay. It might take five years. It might take ten years. It might take twenty years. Like for me personally, it's taken nearly eight years to get to that level where I'm happy as where it stands, and everyone likes where it stands, and it's really working. Would you say you've been guilty of again trying to run faster than it was possible at any point of the of um, based no. on social media, based on what you've seen outside, based on what, seeing other what, brands? What do you mean run faster? So let's say if you're having a you know a growth curve which is good, fast, steady, you're making money, you're happy, you're learning, and you wanted to take that growth to an even faster level based on what you would see from new brands who have made took investment, would you say that you have changed at any point in that journey? And got caught up as most humans do at some point. To, yeah. To to accelerate the brand faster than is possible at the moment. From yeah. Max, they, all pressures from social media. That's mm, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the runway shows is the exact example of that. Um, and I did four of those, and they didn't work. They didn't really pay off to an extent, and they didn't propel the brand into a level that I thought it would. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can be consumed by perception. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I admit I've had that a lot. Yeah, I think every brand owner does, yeah. and I think um, I, I, my, the patterns that I see often is year zero to three. You know, a lot of brands. If if you're good, you have a good run because your overheads are low, your vision is clear. Then you get caught up in watching left, right, and center, thinking, oh, this this person's bigger yeah. than me. Yeah. I want a piece of their pie. But is is that like a thing that comes as you progress? Like you see other brands that you didn't like you see as far as this wall, but as when you get to that wall, you can see the next wall. Uh-huh. And do you not think that's what's then pushing you to do all these other things? And you get to that wall and that on, on the outside of that wall, there's another, however many people doing however many great things that you want to be involved in. And you then try and get to that. But as a matter of fact, you're actually dispersing yourself too far and 100%, yeah. Not staying true to your own well, and I, I'm yeah, that, completely guilty of that. Yeah. I think we're all guilty. I yeah. Like when, when MDV got to year three, we had we, we had crazy profit for the first three years, 
and I'm trying to be everything. I'm looking at everyone. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm to, trying to be everything. I'm trying to be everything. I'm looking at everyone else, and then you've got to scale. You've got to hire staff. You've got to do infrastructure, and then when you're spreading your staff thin in terms of purchase and stock, and you've got increased overhead, yeah, it, it takes its toll. And I think I think it's a pattern of you know people who have success in the early years, which is quite unorthodox in business, start to think they can do everything. Yeah, you believe it. You believe in everything because why wouldn't you? Correct. Oh, and then correct. the next if few you, years, you, yeah. you feel it, and yeah. then you get back on your path and success comes back. And but do you not believe you've got to go kind of like down to that yeah, do you? to actually so. realize 100%, if yeah. you was constantly pushing out hits and constantly impossible, hitting, yeah. it's impossible. hitting them great numbers and whatever and constantly growing at this exact same mm -hmm. speed all the time, mm -hmm. when's going to be the downfall? Yeah. Would you like, is that at the end? You'd rather, you'd rather it be that yeah. slope that goes up and down and up and down so Correct. you can learn all the way through and then propel yourself. I think it's just a case of staying in the game. If, yeah. you're, if you're a business owner, you need to know those mis those mistakes and those hours are going to come. But don't make the hours and the mistakes so big it takes you out of the game. Yeah, you know of course. I mean? That's yeah. the key because you're going to lose. It depends on your scale of your business, but you're going to you're going to have uh, years where you you know make half your profit or zero profit or whatever it is. But you can't be making big losses which take your cash because yeah. that kind of take the future years of trying again out of the game and that's what you gotta you gotta keep in mind don't gamble so because that risk reward uh that risk reward reward relationship like do take risks it's necessary yeah no you've got to believe in yourself um you got to believe in yourself and you've got to take the risks but don't be don't be stupid isn't it really yeah but don't, don't be too stupid but what is stupid because that risk reward relationship some i think, people it's could stupid. think it's no risk but it could be the biggest risk but the if you assess it and you have people in your business that have been doing it with you and you can assess it with them and it it seems like it's the right thing then most of the time it probably is but what if you're the leader what if you're the pe the person that someone always looks up to and let's say your clarity of that situation is skewed which is also very possible yeah because you as you said earlier in the conversation there's nobody to bounce off yeah so let's say you've had three years of great success you you think that your filter of clarity is bang on which it seems like it's on paper yeah. let's say if your team is relying on you to make a decision and you're like well i've got most of my decisions right but you could be making the biggest risk of your life and not know it and that's the hard part as a as an entrepreneur i believe yeah and i suppose that thing goes through your head every single day doesn't it yeah you just got to put up with it man carry on <laughs> Yeah, I think it, that I think it's really important to have a circle around you, which because when you're emotionally invested in your own brand, we as humans we're naturally biased. So we're naturally, when we want to do something, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. You find reasons to support that theory. It's called confirmation bias. And I think what you need to do is find someone who's also got like good clarity, a smart person, yeah, who that's... doesn't have the emotional investment, can just tell you you're being biased. Because deep down, you'll probably know you're being biased too. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, you're so yeah, passionate. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you want to do it. But it's, that's why it's good to have people that you can talk to that are in the same circle or in the same industry as you, but even on different levels. Like, we're, we're in the same industry. We sell different products, but you can tell me when I'm being stupid and I can tell you when you're being stupid with mm -hmm. things. And, it, and it, I guess it kind of brings you down to a reality where you're not, too yeah, emotionally invested not too emotionally invested you're actually looking at it from the outside you're looking at yourself from the outside yeah. so you understand it more yeah i think that checklist that i mentioned i, I, I read uh, ray dalio's principles and he calls them principles i call right. it a checklist what's that a book yeah yeah okay and he basically every decision he has whether that's in your decision design details or buying details or wherever you go into wholesale you create a checklist for all of those scenarios and then you answer those checklists and from, if you, so like I said, if you want to go to a wholesale and let's say, does the brand fit represents the identity? Do they give you good payment terms? Yeah. Are they going to, are they going to discount it fast? Whatever. If they don't tick your principles, then you don't do the thing. And then that removes all emotional bias. So yeah. let's say you design a product and you mentioned about uh, the toe box, the sole, the, the heel, whether it's easy to slip on. If those principles are not ticked, you do not go ahead with the product, yeah. even if you might think at that moment this it's is the best thing yeah, in the yeah, world, yeah. because those principles are what gave you success before. And of course, you can add principles and maybe take one or two away. But let's say if it's a ten-point principle, five of them are always going to be fundamentally sound. And I think that's some advice I could give to people: is just find what success looks like, write it down on paper, and make sure that 
you follow it for the next time and tweak. Obviously, things change, times change. We mentioned yeah. genius. They're not. I was going to say, yeah, make sure you tweak it as things change. One hundred percent. Silhouettes change. You know. But I think that's a good way of looking at it and having that checklist and actually filling that checklist in from another point of view would also be great. Yeah. So you mean another person? Another person, or you coming at it differently? You put yourself in your scenario in the scenario of someone else. Oh, okay. I actually thought if you don't have that other person to do hard it. I actually thought to myself I don't. if Lewis asked me for advice I'm sure if he give him pretty good advice but would you take that yourself correct and also but that's a skill. this is a skill that's a fucking this is a very skill. hard skill yeah. mm -hmm. I sometimes say I know if he asks me a question he's in a scenario I'd give him pretty good yeah, advice I do. well yeah, he always yeah, says yeah. it to me so, okay so you, don't know, you always, always say it to me like ask yourself the question I'm like oh, well I'll tell you that and you're like well, say it to yourself then correct and I do it sometimes too but I know I'm doing it I'm like Wait a minute, this doesn't make sense because if someone was in the same situation, I wouldn't have time to do this. Mm. And I think that's when you're mad at people, angry at people, just you need to give yourself time, mm. give yourself time to think clearly because when we're emotional, we're all emo emotional people, we can't think straight. We literally yeah. cannot make good decisions and that's why sometimes it's just good to be calm and give yourself a day or two, as long as it takes really to, to kind of remove your emotions, to see things. Yeah, to, yeah, and come, at, come into it from different scenarios. Like if you're if you're cooked up doing this at night and you 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 need to go and get a fresh head on it, come at it from a different scenario, have a look at it in a different place and a different time, and then assess what the actual difference is from in there. Yeah. How do you find your perfect decision making mentality? What what do you do? <laughs> do you know what actually? I'm I'm most active at like six till eight a.m. Yeah, like when I'm, good, I, and I go to the gym and that's when most of my ideas come to mind and that's when I'm like I'm like at my highest point of the day mm -hmm. so when I get in in the mornings I'm I'm good in, into the office I mean I'm I'm good to just go straight into things and make sure things are working whereas I it, it, it kind of dies down as the day goes on so do you think that's just I think that's human uh, human uh, nature, like as the, we can only make about three good decisions a day, and after that, it's, is that what it is? I think so. Yeah, right. straight down. Yeah. I guess I might as well go back to sleep then. At nine, <laughs> nine, nine well, those are, well, those are the highest paid people in the world. The people that make the the least decisions that get paid the most. So Very much. Well, what's his name? Um, uh, Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, yeah, Jeff Bezos. He says that he, you know he only goes into the office for two hours a day, where he has meetings between like twelve and two, and that's oh, when really? he has does his most decisions that's it yeah between those two hours i think you have like a peak time in your day where like that's the best time you're at yeah. i feel like i have that anyway do you yeah and as soon as you get tired again if you're tired emotional yeah forget about it yeah. don't even try and make a decision yeah. and what do you think throws you off what do you think when you made your worst decisions in your business where, when has that been because obviously your, time. Per your personal life <laughs> yeah personal it as well yeah no 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 Everything. when when I was going through a bad time personally I guess I was making the worst de business decisions and it, it actually made a made a big bump in my business and made a big like hole that I had to get out of but again I I love that that happened because it's happened and I've learned from it and I've I've like I actually enjoyed the process of like getting out of it and like when you, I know you talk about going down to zero and coming back yeah, up yeah, yeah. and I suppose it's like, what, what's the Churchill's uh, film called? The, the Darkest Hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like your darkest hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you, I, I think that in that darkest hour, your state of mind is like 10 times what your usual state of mind is because you're very uncomfortable, but you have to do things to make it work. And when you are an entrepreneur and you are wanting to just be the best you can be that that i guess that time is the best time well it is in my opinion yeah no one knows who they truly are or what they're truly capable of about going to that darkest hour right i think that's necessary right actually. and I, I, I literally i loved it i loved the, the happening of it and you don't love but, it in the moment no. yeah in the moment in the moment no you don't love it but you, you want to kill no, yourself no, no. pretty much yeah. well <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no that, and, that. and it's true, and 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 I'm sure a lot of people will watch yeah, this. Yeah, will yeah. be in that in that dark because I would pray yeah. maybe right now. Yeah, no, and, and that's why we're doing this to show people that you can actually bounce back from it, and that you can you can use it as your advantage to then get to that next level. That you you was if you was cruising like this and something happened, you don't then cruise like that. You you go up and you go further. Yeah, and as you should be able to do that as a human, so. 
use it use it against it yeah what um what contributed to your your darkest hour um i kind of fell out of love with what i was doing and, okay with yeah 100%. yeah i kind of fell out of love with it why it was, was that um my mind was elsewhere yeah um girls going going to other places doing other things seeing other things and like i guess comparison <sighs> I don't know if it's comparison. I think it's just like young, being yeah, hungry. being young and and no, not even being hungry. I think it was being complacent. Okay, like it, he, was, he was making a lot of money in those years, too. making a lot, so, of, yeah, making a lot of money, enjoying it, and then realizing like all that hard work, all them eighteen-hour days every single day for like four years, and then it's a long stretch, yeah. And then enjoy thinking, yeah, enjoying it. And people tell you like, oh, go and enjoy yourself. So mm. like, go and do this, go and do that, or take a break. Or, and and you start listening to them, and you start mm. doing it. And it, it's not. I, 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 for me, it's not good for me. No, it's very fine lines. It's, isn't it? Yeah, it's very really fine lines. lines. But like, listening to other people, kind of put me in that in that place. And then I, I guess it just I guess it just changed the way I was for a while. Did you, did you ever get this feeling of it's too it's been too easy? Is this it? Not not that it's been too easy because it's never been easy for me. It's been it's been a struggle. Like I started off as zero. I've got no investors. I've got no no one ever gave me a hand. No one ever wanted to help me. Like that's how it's been. Like I've only it's been me and my brother through yeah. and through. And it'll never be di never be different because I've got through that point of having to do that stuff. And I was listening to a podcast last night and I was saying like no one makes eight figure brands that haven't had investment and i was so thinking true. about us and i was like true, yeah. it's, like it's we it's are fun. those people yeah. like we're we're those one percent of people that actually have done that and surpassed that so why would we go and let someone else have a slice of it when we've done all this work to actually get there but going back to that darkest hour yeah i, I think it's just listening to people and and not taking your own advice on things and it, you kind of slip away into something that you're not. So how do you guard against complacency now? Because I, that's one of my, like I think it's in the previous type of podcast, I've got one tattoo would be that. Mm. How do you guard against that? Because we're all guilty of... How do you guard against that, complacency? Because everyone's going to fall into a trap. It even happens to us yeah, now all the time. Do you think it's people around you sense checking you or, you know, a circle? I think it's in, it's in your... I think you've got to do it to go through it. You've got to have got complacent and stuff's got to have happened to you for you to then not go back to that point but i think it's all about your your mind and like i don't know how to explain it but the harder you work at something the more you do for yourself the easier it's going to get mm -hmm. and i believe in the 10,000 10,000 rule where you do something 10,000 times it's going to work mm -hmm. it's got to work like if you're constantly it's, it's, it's like a compound pounding yeah, 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 theory so. whereas you hit something so many times it, it's it's eventually going to break it's eventually going to break and people will hit something so many times and get to that point where it's about to break and then back off but if you can get to that point where it breaks and carry on hitting it anyway mm. i think you're on another level and, and i think everyone can be like that everyone can be like that i think it's just training your body and training your mind like like even you with fasting, you both do fasting, don't you? Like mm -hmm. that's that's a really like, um, it's like a hard at start. It's, hard, it's and that's the difference. It's, it's hard at start, easy right. after. Well, right. You, it's you, dedication. So you said something to me yesterday about I think it was Tiger Woods and Tiger Woods. Yeah. So repeat that. So I said uh, so I was watching a video of Tiger Woods basically, and um, he had one of his uh, coaches with him, and he was changing his game for longevity basically. So he was changing his swing, so yeah. he was losing, using his back a lot less. And because they changed his swing, obviously he needed to practice it. But the goal and so. They, you know, they tweaked his swing a little bit. Tiger went to the range and he hit a thousand balls a day for, I think it was 60 days. And then he said, this is the difference between a professional and an amateur. So I would tell Tiger Woods, who's a very good professional, very skilled as well, and the best in the world, and he would hit a thousand balls a day for 60 days. I would now tell an amateur the exact same thing. They'd go to the driving range, they'd hit 100 balls for 30 minutes, and then they'd say, this isn't working. They'd switch yeah. straight back to what they do. Yeah. And that sums up humans in today. They, that's the difference. They don't get success fast, they stop, and say it doesn't work. Mamba mentality. Yeah, well, yeah. That's all they it give is. up it's way just, too soon. Yeah, it's just self-dedication, self self-realization, and just 
like if you believe it you can achieve it so For sure. just give it everything yeah i think going back to the point of balance i mean i mean tiger's story is quite incredible how he got caught cheating which obviously yeah. is it's not not a great thing to do but i hate to say it his cheating and his messed around made him great obviously that was his balance and i know people can disapprove but his balance of you know, having a secret life, doing what he want, he's still focused on being the best golfer. And then his results spoke for itself. The moment that kind of equilibrium was disrupted, and let's say his messing around was not allowed to be done, and he, he couldn't even focus on being a good golfer anymore. He just couldn't do it. And I think that's key. You mentioned about going out and girls and stuff. And I think whatever makes you perform at peak performance, whether that's someone disapproves of it or not, if that's what's making yeah. you and your business be great, do it. Because no one's going to approve of anything you do in this yeah. world. And I think... You know, everyone's so quick to judge in other people's lives, and um, most humans are hypocrites too. They say they don't like it, but continuously do it. We mentioned about people who read newspapers or disapprove of programs and TV shows, but they still watch them every night. Yeah, they yeah, complain of Instagram, but they're still yeah. stalking. They compl- they complain about the implications of things like Love Island, but then they're the first people to say, "Oh, well, I don't like this person," and then next thing you know, year down the line, and everyone's uproar. Yeah, <laughs> and I think. Uh, in terms of complacency, I think what you you've got to do is uh, you have to live paranoid because yeah um, you have, you have but paranoid. like you've got to enjoy it as well. Like yeah. I enjoy the fact that I'm nowhere near my like not my goals, but like just my even my health and fitness. I'm nowhere near my peak, and I always thought like you're going to start declining and things are going to ha- happen this way. But like I like pushing the boundaries, mm-hmm. and I think that you can get. There's like the human body can do so much. That oh, yeah, can, okay, like yeah. apparently you're working at forty percent. Goggins, the Goggins. Yeah, Goggins, Goggins says yeah. that when you're when you feel like you're about to fail, when like physical, you you're probably at forty percent of what you actually can For sure. do. One hundred percent. Yeah. Put that mentality in your head and go and do your run and see how far you can go, and then do that every single day and keep hitting it. And it's, I think that's how you break break the boundary that's in your actual mind of how far you as a person can go and what do you think your equilibrium is what do you think your balance of peak performance is you run every morning i see it on instagram no i, was, only, I no, said no, no, every, up, not not every morning i said, the, right. I said the guy runs 10k i said i can't even run 1k no more no, so obviously fitness isn't part of my peak performance but what's yours why isn't it i, 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 I think he, it he can doesn't be. train he doesn't it, train yeah i know you don't but it can be i think it, if you it, did it train it would man when i'm when i'm going through this this running time, like I couldn't run at all mm. until like last year. I could not do fucking half a kilometer. Now I do, yeah, I do ten k most mornings. But when I get to the, there's like a, a a space in time when I'm in that run. Maybe it's after twenty minutes. Maybe it's after nine yeah. minutes. Whatever. Where yeah, I'm on a different different fucking level in my brain, and it, and I'm thinking about all these amazing things, ready to write them down after it. But yeah. that's 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 like when I said that. I'm, that's when I'm at my peak of the day i think with me with fitness because i played football my whole life and when i you when MDB take was, a break from it yeah when mdv was formed it was wake up at six drive for two hours right. train go to the office but and then i think you know that my you have a you have a mental um picture of a situation and i think i was so tired doing both yeah. that thinking of doing exercise in this now now it, it probably isn't true it's probably like a a bad uh, imprint on my yeah it is that's what it is that's exactly so what it I is i need to kind of kind of get rid of that imprint to enjoy mm-hmm. it again because i'm like oh i don't want to feel tired and work and, I, and then going back to being feeling tired you can't make right decisions so i think it's breaking no, that barrier which you, lewis said about you don't stopping. need to feel tired though you need to get your rest but he's lucky and though this. he's lucky that he looks good if right, he yeah, looks like a doesn't sack of matter shit. that you look good. It's not about the way you look. I agree, it's but how, it's about how you feel. No, you're right. you're both but right. if you look really good, you just sometimes I can skip it today. I can skip it today. And, and he what? has what? superior genetics in terms right, of his right, physique. Right, right. But I watch what I eat. Yeah, I'm, sometimes. I'm, he, also not passed, yesterday. he also passed for 23 out of yeah, 24 yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the reason, the big reason why I do fast is because yeah. I don't want to go to the gym. I mean, I say I don't want to go to the no, gym. But, I mean, I, I have like a little, a little dust up a box and like <laughs> once uh, for, for no, but, a week. Are we fighting tonight? Yeah. Fasting though <laughs> makes you feel like an apex predator. That's yeah, it does. Yeah, I, can no, say. Like, I know it does. I've done it. I know it does. But at the same point, there is a moment in your mind when you are either lifting weights or you're pushing yourself. You need to push yourself physically to be able to push yourself mentally. Yeah. Right. So why aren't you doing it? is something I need to improve on and then I'll be a superior apex predator exactly <laughs> legit but no, you won't no, be able to fast legit. as much as you do oh well, yeah and I, I guess that fasting was my compromise not saying yeah. I'm not I, yeah, think, yeah, I agree yeah. with your point I don't think I still think you should exercise um, but that was my compromise and 
It's might... crazy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's as nice as it all. No, it doesn't. I still got the. Well, you do, well, you do VR there. boxing. Yeah, but I haven't VR done it lately. Yeah. He doesn't lift weights or anything, but you wouldn't know that he didn't lift weights. That's the funny thing. It's yeah. mad. So back on to obviously, let's go back onto business. So Genetics, you would man. never take investment or sell the brand or anything along those lines. I'd never take investment um, because I don't really. I never. I never researched it. I never learned about it because I never wanted it, and I never wanted to have someone who I have to answer to, someone I have to uh, go through to be able to put my designs out there. Like, this is a this is a personal project, so if there's someone who's top end that isn't in that, isn't that person, then is it gonna really work? Like, yeah, I might get a chunk of money or I might be able to propel the brand into this much revenue, but it's not, it's not true. Like, I like, I like truth and I'm, I'm from a design background and not from a business background and I never really, worked out how that how that whole thing worked and never trusted it all yeah. and i always read bad stories about it and all my friends that and most did of them it. are bad yeah most yeah, them my, are, yeah like yeah. it always ends up sour so i'm like yeah I'll, i'm do this myself why not so if the situation arose and this is uh, what you said then is exactly how i feel like i don't want to answer to anyone i don't want anyone to take away from the brand yeah you know beauty and what it is but what if you found that person or brand or business who allowed you to be you yeah. and fix the other side of the business which allowed you to be better at being you um that's a tough one that would be great but at the same time I'd, i want to learn that myself i want to learn the parts that i can't grasp or the things that i don't spend enough time on i actually want to learn that myself so later in life i do have the ability to do it all over again on my own if it needs be isn't it better to learn off someone who is really good at it and obviously on your team at that point rather than learn the hard way because you mentioned about having a mentor and i think we would all agree if there was someone who we admired and was in a you know you're everything costs a price it does yeah, but like, sometimes that price that small price to pay could guarantee you you as a person in terms of your intelligence and your know-how and your brand you both could propel way faster for for a price which in the grand scheme of things, might be a small price to pay. Right. That's the balance, I guess. And if that thing comes along, then yeah, I'll accept it with open arms and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But it's rare. It's it's rare, and you can you can extract that information out of each other. Like, look at look what yeah. you guys have done. Mm -hmm. I can pull information from you that I'd never know of. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's what that's like. What having a good circle is all about. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can all push yourself constantly between each other, and kind of even. Not, not class it as competition, but have people in your circle that are ahead of you as mm. well. It's necessary. Yeah. It will make you start to look into these things and research these things and work out how you can do it for your brand, and you you'll eventually become the full package. Like it might take I twenty agree. years, might take forty years. It's that's that's the whole beauty of it. Like you can't have everything as a human. I think that's a that's a good analogy, think, yeah. and it's good that you said you're willing to wait. I'm willing to wait too. Um, yeah. And the point about the circle, me and Lou spoke about this yesterday, actually, and we were saying that we are very lucky, you know, we've all, we've all came from all different backgrounds and none of us started in business with any mentors or any experience and fortunately we've all been able to push each other, challenge each other from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different standpoints, Yeah. Um, not always agree but never fall out. And I think another good point that men suffer with big time is ego because that... Man, I, I didn't, like, we're from the same fucking city hmm. and... Well, we're not from the same city, but we live in the same city and we have brands and like that in in effect should have made us come together. Sooner, yeah. Way sooner. And I just and I, I guess I had an ego. We both did. And I guess you had an ego yeah. and I just always dismissed it and like didn't believe it and then I think it's a young in a young twenties. Yeah, just, yeah. I think we all do. We I all did. Yeah. I, I think, think once you get over it then it, you're in a, you're in a completely yeah, different... I think that's a super important thing to, to, yeah. to, to, to touch on. There's a lot of people that are going to have brands out there with competitors. Mm. They yes, they can be competitors, but they can still speak, acknowledge yeah, each other, help each other, and then both grow from it. Yeah, and I think, especially in the fashion industry, that's such a like a thing to touch on because there's so much like aggravation and, and like I hate between each other's brands yeah. that it's like, why? It's, what it's, is the, the point, best, man? It's the best thing ever. You're gonna, it's, if you can come together and and like put put what you know and put what them know together to become something between both brands like there's enough money in the world to more than enough. do you know what i mean so why why does it and you're both going to do it anyway matter. so yeah. you might as well you know speak 
I think it's the best thing ever actually having people cough for you, try and take your space. As much as it's annoying, so none of us can sit here and go, it doesn't annoy us, because it does. But at the same time, it makes you much better. If people hadn't come around from Lewis's brands, my brands, and tried to copy us or do this, that, and the other, we wouldn't be half as good as we are today because you get complacent. If you're the only one in your field running the show and no one's trying to copy you, you'll never achieve as half as much as what you can. The moment someone tries to copy you, or the moment someone tries to, whether that's creative product, the moment try, try someone tr- tries to, you know, write articles on the big I am and you and you know yeah. that they're not, that is inspiring. That's ego driven a little bit too because you're like, you like the, mm. the alpha man's like, ah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that makes you better and it's necessary. So when people do copy your brand or whatever, don't be, don't be mad and, and crumble, be mad and be inspired to go, okay, I'm going to distance ourselves from this brand so so big and the gap's going to be so big that you don't even put us in the same conversation because the moment someone puts, uh, representing a conversation with whoever yeah. you classes <laughs> classes your conversation well obviously you're not doing enough to make sure that doesn't happen and i'm guilty of that too and then you get to work and go there's no co- don't ever put you know doesn't your brand in the it? same yeah. roof as mine do you know what i mean and that's ego too but you know women <laughs> yeah yeah it's very true um i think you just gotta enjoy it and i don't know that whole copying thing is like we're all we're all guilty of it as mm-hmm. such. We've all used aspects of other people's things to create things. Yeah. But when you get to a level where the the world is looking at your brand and people are then copying your product like detail for detail, it's then much, yeah. it's just like what the what is going on? Like it's just hilarious. I think it's necessary, you know, as a as a as an entrepreneur or designer. To increase your skill set, you have to copy something at the start. Yeah, you have to take as like even literature. like I do with my shoes or when, yeah. when I'm designing something, I always take them little aspects of different things. But it's the, I guess it's the people that straight up rip, much, yeah. rip a product off. It's just like why yeah. have you done that? You've you've ruined your own future. Mm. Like no, it's, it's not an issue to us. It's an issue to yourself. How 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 are you measuring the success of represent moving forward? Do you look at turnover, profit? Like, how are you measuring the success of the brand? Turnover and profit, yeah, obviously, because that's the numbers. That's your, that's your bottom numbers. But not only that, it's it's creating them them classic products that I that I can sell for the remainder of however long I want or however long the brand goes for. Like creating them classic silhouettes that I can just switch up the colorways on and make make it I guess it's I guess it's just the essentials I guess we're just making them silhouettes and making them products and and hitting and and yeah hitting them targets of quality and and detail that I can then keep at a level yeah. for the remainder of the brand and that's I, I think when you get to that level of these are my products and this is what we're going to do every season yeah you've got to twist it up and yeah you got to change things and yeah you got to touch on trends but when you get to that level, I guess that's when your brand really becomes an actual brand. Do you predict the future of your profit and the turnover? Um, for the for the very near future, yeah. But so I you don't look s- at five years away. I don't look at ten years. So away. next year, you would only predict for let's say next year. Yeah, yeah. This year, twenty. Sorry, yeah, twenty twenty. But when yeah, you're obviously, year, I have like little notes in my phone of yeah. what I want to do in twenty one and what yeah. I want to do in twenty two and what I would like to. So, so what like does that be. what does that look like? Looks looks amazing, man. <laughs> Obviously, it's always, always gonna look amazing. amazing. With, it? No, I have my goals are like, I, my goals aren't really business goals as such. My goals are a bit personal goals, mm. like of where I want to be when I'm age thirty, what I want to achieve, what I want to have in my possession. Um, You're twenty six now. Twenty six, yeah. Okay, so you're a year younger than me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thirty. Go on. What we're looking at nah, tell 30 us. is looking good man <laughs> tell us. i was always worried that like shit when i'm 30 i'm gonna i'm like if i'm not married and have kids and oh, all like, that kind of stuff all the office longer <laughs> and i used to and i had a friend that was like 32 and he didn't have any of that and then i was like oh shit you don't actually need to be like that no. the, the real world is giving you anything. no you don't need and threats. the real world tries to push you into this Correct. thing of like you have to have a girlfriend no, you have know. to be you have to be married living with the girlfriend kids. like house just do whatever the hell 100%. you want that makes you feel happy anything. exactly it doesn't man. matter and as I said that, anything yeah I only realised that like yeah. not too long ago like a couple of years ago that actually 
that that just does not matter to me yeah. like i love the sun i love los angeles i want to be i, I want to be living in los angeles at we know that is there every week yeah, man. <laughs> so we, I want that. let's go okay. out sorry yeah i can't afford it we're gonna go next week everyone <laughs> <laughs> now that's where i want to be i want to be in la whether the brand's in la or the brand's still here i don't know i want to be there my brother is my partner and he, he loves it more than anything so well. he want to go to la too yeah he loves yeah. it man his girlfriend lives there we always go there and like we're very creative when we're together alone whereas when you're in an office and there's things going on all the mm. time and your designers are coming in and asking questions and like you're actually trying to run a business as well as a design school then it's very hard to actually get into that space where it's just you and well where it, for me it's just me and him yeah and we just thrash out design like we have these fucking moments where it's just like we'll be sat in a hot tub in the pool in fucking la and it's that's when something comes to life. And they're the moments that, yeah, it might have cost a lot of money to get there. No, it's not so. but, it, but actually, it's that's true. made something. We whereas when you're sat time. in the office all day, every day, yeah. and it's kind of like cabin fever, whereas you're not actually progressing. No, 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 100%. No, I agree. So, we always talk about it. We've spoke about this more in the last six months more than ever, and we're both tired. There's no doubt about it. We're both tired. <laughs> I'm um, not tired at all. Bro. No, you're not, but we are because <laughs> because we we came from such normal. We're such normal people. We we have mo- we have a lot of That's money, a, but we don't feel like we have a lot of money. It's like, no, and I yeah. guess it's that so anxiousness weird. of like losing it, which is also detrimental. Rather than thinking, let's just do better. And I always say, if you're half as good as we think we are, the money is going to be endless. right. But at the same time... And you time, don't believe in the concept of spend money to make money. Yes. But well, we I'm, didn't. We no, were like, spend less. <laughs> spend less. <laughs> no, we, we do, but you always have to keep reminding yourself. And I don't mean, I don't no, mean spend money was. on stock to make more money. I no. mean spend money on no. these things. We was like, on it right. on a business perspective Exactly. Only. Only. Right. Correct. So, so say us three went to a fucking chalet in the Alps for five nights. <laughs> yeah. So think the price you say, nope. Think about... <laughs> yes, stay in the caravan. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But think about the the what you could thrash out in those five nights and how yeah, much I more agree. you'd learn off each other Thanks. and what you'd actually like. I, th- we agree I think now. I think your thoughts today have is a reflection of you six to nine months ago. No, it's our thoughts. Are, oh, our, our thoughts six months ago. Our thoughts ten years ago. That's right. the problem. Well, even Honestly, further. we we think too so, poorly. Yeah, we so, think too well. Not now, but we did. Yeah. Right. So in nine months, what is going to come into effect is what you're thinking of now. Right? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. So yeah. go and put yourself in a fucking situation that's really good for you and and just just get into it. Don't don't like don't hesitate to just let it out and get into it and well, put that's what we did with the body. Up. That's 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 why you bought a Rolls Royce. Yeah. yeah. Lewis is driving a, a Porsche, which is a nice car of course, but compared to his, his net worth is is absolutely a car that is you know. And that's that's another thing like and and you feel and you feel different, right? You yeah, feel different. you get the respect that you. Let's say, re, did, unfortunately, in this world, you need material things to get that respect. Most of the time, with me, more importantly, you feel you feel. I feel like, like a Rolls Royce. Correct. Yeah, the and thing, the thing, Rolls Royce, Rolls, Rolls Royce is just different, man. Like, I get, I still get in my Rolls Royce. I've had a Rolls Royce. For, You've had, had this, how many? This one for three years. I had one before that for a yeah, year. Yeah. So I've had Rolls Royce for four years. And I'm for, Rolls Royce you're still getting that car every day, and you think, I'm this the bollocks. is fucking, this is dope. I'm the bollocks, that's what you think. <laughs> like, not even that. <laughs> I don't think that, but I think, mm. like, yeah, I, I absolutely love this, like, this machine. And that's why I'm so inspired by them. But I've never had that feeling in another car. And I've had other cars, and I've drove other cars, and like, Mike has had a Ben, Mike has a Bentayga. We've had fucking Lamborghinis and shit. And, I don't. I That's never sad. got in them and thought, oh, I love this. I actually love the feeling mm. it gives me. Well, I've been torn. I changed my cars a lot, and I've been. It's, it's what Lewis said about if you don't have the car, people don't show you respect, and that's just the, the way it's life well, works. But does it? Does, do, do you do you think that feeling is of people showing you respect? Do you think that's actually real, or is that just in your head? No, uh, it's real. I it's think real. it's real. Yeah, yeah. Really? Because unfortunately, that's just the world we live in. People Sorry. just cares about care about yeah. cars. Parents, yeah. They don't even care about houses anymore. People just care about cars. I used an analogy yesterday. And jewelry. If we have five cars uh, worth uh, two point five mil, obviously they're expensive cars. Um, but you have ten mil in the bank, and you show a screenshot of ten mil in the bank, or you show an Instagram picture of five cars which are worth two point five mil. 
I guarantee if you did a poll, people think the person with all those cars is richer. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. And that's all, that, yeah. all of that stuff doesn't matter. That's all ego driven. But the point I was trying to make is that I've gone from a Rolls Royce to a, a normal car, so to speak, which is still a good car, don't get me wrong. And for, you know what, I'm not here to impress people. I don't care. I know I'm rich. I know I'm doing well. I'll drive my normal car to work and I'll go yeah. home. But when I woke up in the morning and got in that car, yeah. I didn't feel... This is the thing. I didn't feel inspired. Mm. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't that's feel... That's the difference. Yeah. Like, I was capable of better. Right. So that, that car, that, this Rolls Royce that cost X amount, right? Priceless. 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 Exactly, because it gives you a feeling mm -hmm. that then changes your day. So yes. If that's changing your day for... Changes your full ideas. Year. Changes your ideas. Yeah. No, it changes that's your like, ideas. That's literally like the same thing we were talking about before about going somewhere and getting your ideas out. That Rolls Royce moment is that same thing. And not only that, it also creates conversation. Like if people say like they go to expensive gyms to meet people that are it worth works. a lot of money. If you're works. pulling up in a in a Rolls Royce to anywhere People want to. People want to know what you do, and oh, that's what even point was, isn't it? Yeah, that's it's tr no, it's true. Want to know what you do, and it's true. Even if it's not a respect thing, you come into conversation with people, and you can hit it off with the right person. Something can come of it in ten years. Something can come of it in twenty years. It doesn't matter. But that's created a connection there, and that's created so many different things that well, it, it is priceless. Let's do a breakdown. If you buy a used Rolls Royce, two hundred grand, and let's say it loses twenty grand a year. Yeah, for twenty grand a year, Rolls Royce. No, nah, um, 200 grand. No, it's okay, call it 30 grand. Let's say you use 30 grand a year. You're telling edit, me that 50. you can't have <laughs> 30 grand worth of ideas just from feeling right. different. Exactly. Changing your molecular structure or your exactly. belief system. Not only that, you mentioned about meeting people. You're telling me you can't make 30 grand worth of connections. Yeah. Whereas if you have a, let's say, a, a C class, 30, 30 grand yep. car, straight away you lose 10 anyway. Yep. So you only lose a third less than having a Rolls Royce but you don't get the same connections and you might feel a little bit better, but you don't feel, nothing in this world makes you feel like a Rolls Royce. Well, that's why Rolls Royce is Rolls Royce. So I guess the, the, the topic of the conversation is you've got to stretch your boundaries to make you feel great. Yeah. Obviously don't stretch it too far, but once you feel great and you have that feeling of not superiority, but you're capable of better, then you've got to have an action to make sure to do that great things. do great things. The problem is, I think, is that people stretch themselves to these nice cars clothes and do fuck all. No, no because it's no. too easy to get. You and can go and get they, it on a They do it for the wrong reason. They do it for women. Yeah, that's true. Men, yeah. men, well, men do it for women. They want to get the nice thing for women. That's yeah, true. no. It's not for exactly, themselves. That's the key. Not for do themselves. For no, that's, that's exactly it. You can, like, anyone can stretch and, and get that fucking car. And it is just a car. And don't get me wrong, like, most people don't care about cars. And, and that's great. But if you actually enjoy cars and you enjoy that feeling of, getting into the best car you could be getting into. No, it's, it's priceless. It really well, is priceless. Well, I think as a human, you should buy almost the best of what you can physically afford at that moment because one, it lasts longer and two, it makes you feel different. It's something that I've learned of recent times. It's like it makes you feel yeah. different. Yeah. If you've got, and you know, they say, oh, Bill Gates only, or Bill Gates and Steve Jobs wear the same T-shirt. Yeah. They're billionaires. They don't, they're already feeling. They don't they're, care about the clothes. Yeah. They're on. They care about the super yachts. They're on a but different planet. On yeah. the way up, they would have done what we're talking about now. Correct. Steve Jobs had crazy cars. He always had a brand new 911. He wore the same clothes, yeah. but why did he have a brand new 911? He might have had the car, but I'm sure if he was to get into, with all due respect to TOT Yaris drivers, he wouldn't have been able to make the iPod. He just wouldn't have. I'm telling you now, he wouldn't have been able to do it. <laughs> so he doesn't get grilled with all due respect. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I know you what you're trying to, to say good. is place you live to. to get yeah, to get to the next level, you've got to you've got to push the level that you're at um, to to be able to achieve the what what it is in the future that you want. Because if you're if you're relying on something that's here, but you want to be here, and you're relying on this thing forever, and you're not jumping to this, yeah. how are you going to get to this from this? Well, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, he says, unless you can visualize yourself as the person that you think you will be with wholeheartedly and you already believe the man walking or the woman walking the streets today is that person, you'll never attain it. Exactly. And I think that's really key. Yeah. I think he will be able to vouch this. The person I was at 13 years old, shoulders high, proud, never arrogant, but confident, is the same person I'm mm -hmm. at 28 years old. And I remember mm -hmm. when I was playing football at 17, and obviously I was you know, doing okay, but... People just go, who do you think he is? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. they knew I was on like, you know, not a lot of money for in the real world, but not for a football player. Who do you think he is? Yeah. Now the same people and have exactly the same to me and they go, he's so humble. 
But why is that? Because they know that the finances align with my demeanor, which is stupid, but that's just how life works. But yeah. I always believed, and I, whether I want to be a billionaire or whatever it is, I already believe in that, whatever my personal goals are. I already believe I've achieved them, and I work every day just to, I'm just working towards what I'm saying I'm going to be in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And I think everyone must do the same, and that's with the actions you take, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, the place you live in. Of course, don't live without your means, but stretch yourself and put in work, and you'll probably get there. And uh, I put something on my Instagram the other day. It was from the... I think it's a 33 strategies of work. It's called death ground strategy. And it says you basically have to put yourself in a position so financially dire that you've got no choice but to, to succeed. Yeah. And that's what you've got to and do. And I suppose that's kind of like the, the darkest hour moment again. Mm, yeah, it is. Like you mm. get into that point where you have to do something to get to that, to get out of it or to get to that next level that like you physically have to do it. So you've got to burn your bridges, don't you? Yeah. Like if you've got a family member or a friend or anyone who can get you out of the shit, you're not you're not really in the shit. Do you know what I mean? No. Like, no me, facts. all of us here, if we are in the shit, no one can save us. No one can save sure. us, and that's why we have to work. And we're taking people down with us, unfortunately. Staff. That's another thing. Family, yeah. you know, we support them all, so they're all. We've got other people on their backs. And I think the people people who don't take risk or or uh, people who complain are often the people who've got that support system in the background so that they're never fully, fully invest in what they want to achieve. You've got to just go, I'm going to invest all the money I've got and if I've got no money, I'm going to have to go and, you know. Invest yeah. all the time you've got. Everything you've got. Yeah. You probably make, you'll find a way because that's what yeah. you, when your back's up against the door, you find a solution, yeah. do you know what I mean? When your back's not up against the door, you don't find a solution because you don't see it in the But it's only the people that are complaining that have never actually tried. It's always the people that are complaining. Yeah, that's No, true. they have tried. They just, Try for five minutes. Think, well, yeah, yeah. No for five happening. minutes, that isn't drawing, in my opinion. Yeah, that's not a given. How many brands have come and fallen that have tried and tried and tried and haven't given it everything? Yeah, and like I think you see it every side, day. People who do try get success, get complacent, and fall anyway. Yeah. That's why there's a lot of people who've come and gone, and they'll happen the, the same. And I said earlier that the brand is the owner. And if the owner is complacent, the brand will die. If the owner is non complacent, the brand will succeed. It's as simple as that. And that's proof in the pudding of all of the brands you've seen come and go on in your sector, MDV sector, other sectors. And I think it's it's all down to the owner. Is it like a theory name for this thing? What is it? <laughs> theory, I don't know. Um, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff, but I never really get this kind of extraction from it was this theory of the complacency complacency and how how, how much I guess it's it's just how much you want it. Yeah. I guess it's just de determination, it to, dedication and hard work. I think it comes down to people not believing that anyone can be us. Anyone can be us if they if they really believe and mm. do it. It's, and people don't actually believe that they think we're some people they think famous people or you know people well, who've got loads of money thought, we thought that well we too. thought that too and this is why I can openly happily say it that you think people are superior and some their powers that they can right. do all this but really they're just real people with a dream and an aspiration to do it and they and just drive, yeah. got on and did it until it succeeded it's that simple I remember when we were kids and we used to like, imagine being a millionaire and I remember I say, speaking about it. I say it now. Yeah. That's what's funny. And it's I like the reason with that. It's like so, you just said, nah, people can't do it. You have to win the lottery. Yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> you become a millionaire and you're like, oh. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Is that is that it? Is that all a million pound is? Yeah. It's but, like it's, it, it, you, do, you do see people as superhumans. And as I said earlier, we are all extremely normal. I mean, just I know we all have a crazy determination, resilience. That's what mm. it comes down to. And I think you have to understand the rules of success. It's like, you're going to get punched and kicked down and think you're in the worst position Correct. in the world. You've got to see through that. Yeah. In, in any, if anything, that darkest hour, you need to keep seeking it. You need yeah. to go into your darkest that's hour what, No, that's what day. I do now every Correct. day. I get. I try and put myself in that, That what we say now is the darkest hour. I try and put myself in that every morning. I try and push my, my body to the limits and then try and push my mind to the limits and then everything after that just like falls into place. So, yeah, I think you got to, I think you, like kind of got to put yourself there. Yeah, but people you, hate. But you got to enjoy the struggle, I guess. But they don't. They hate people. They hate people. It's like um, training a muscle; it hurts, and then it fixes itself. Mm. But that's okay with a muscle. But you got to break it down to that for it to grow, right? But people don't want to break their mind, and that's a really hard place to get out of your mind. And the mind is what makes us grow. 
muscles are okay because muscles repair themselves and it's just a, you, yeah. you prod it but when it's a, a mind what are you prodding that ain't <laughs> you ain't got no muscle <laughs> when, when your mind is when your mind is torn no one wants to go there it's, and I understand why but it's necessary because you become a better a, a dot connector I, I always say I'm no cleverer than anyone else but I connect dots extremely well I yeah. spot patterns fast and that's my skill. Do you know what I mean? And I only and that wasn't. And you're not skill. born with it, are you? No, you're not. You're not born with it. You, you like, learn it over time. You learn it, yeah. But no, in terms of the what I call it, I think people fail because they don't think long term enough. They follow trends. They think uh, they get complacent, and that's it. That's the primary thing. It's the same with music. You look at the artists and they yeah. come over here. Yeah, they course. start buying all the jewelry, have all the cars, they have all the women. They get complacent, yeah. or they've just been following a trend. So yeah. they've got no real skill set. And I think the key is to build skill sets which last the tail of the time. And then going back to the principles, have those principles a bit fluid so you can add one in, take one out, and that's the skill. And if you look at all the greatest artists, they've, they've dipped into trends when necessary, and they've dipped out, but they've always stayed true to who Jay-Z or Drake mm, or Kanye yeah, is. Yeah. But they yeah. still they still dip in and dip out, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but they've always thought, what is the long term? I'm not gonna do any decision that's going to mess up my brand. My my brand is Drake. My brand is Jay Z, and yeah, that's what brands that, should that's do. That's so important. Yeah. So important to to stay in your lane, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how low you go. Like if you 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 build that presence and you build that that brand identity to a point where everyone knows it and everyone knows what you stand for and everyone knows what your product is, and that's why you succeed. It comes down to graphics, web design. If you start to do like a a neon pink um, comb page. They'd be like, I would say straight away, that ain't represent. If yeah, you saw that, you'd be like, no fucking yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You just... and, that's, and your customer notices it. People think you can get away with it. You get away with it a little bit. Do it too long, your customer's like, I don't want to wear it no more. They've, they've changed. We've seen it a lot recently. Yeah. Oh, we've seen it. We're all, like, I've done it myself. We've all done it. We've all, we've all tried and tested other things. And, it's, and you always come back to the same goal you had originally. In this. Black. Yeah, black. <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, I think I think uh, next time we should um, get your brother down as well. Next time we yeah, do one, I think we should, yeah. I think we should get his brother. I know what, next time. Mike oh, we, to be much. fair, we thought you were going to bring him. No, he doesn't say much. But no, Mike's like I'm. I'm a creative person, but Mike's um, on a whole other level to that. Yeah. Mike is very. Is it called introverted? When yeah, 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 he's very, very, very introverted, and he's very, very good at what he does. Um, so introverts come alive in interesting correct. conversations, though. So yeah. I think they we... also come alive at night as well. Oh well, He's uh, opposite to me. Well, make sure we bring him down at twelve pm then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, he's, he's sick though. Like I can give him a concept and he can create something out of it so well now. And it's taken, like I say, it's taken eight years to find yeah. our find our feet and and show what what we are. And he's he's like got to this level of design now where I could actually not. I wouldn't need to be there anymore in terms of like actually design, even though I love it and I love mm. make, making sure things are going on and I, I always give him the initial concept and that's what he comes back with. Like, it, it's great. So how would you describe your roles? How would you describe your role and his role? And, and obviously um, they work great together, but... I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm the creative director and Mike's the design director. Okay. Which, again, it, it sounds the same kind of thing, that's but... Nice. I like I like to put concepts together. I like to build a story and build a campaign and create a mood. And then my I, I can't physically, I don't have the patience and time to actually then sit down at a desk and and make that that mood come to life. Whereas he's fucking really good at that. Yeah. Um, so that's why it works so good. Like we work, we have the same office, we have the same desk. Like our computers are facing opposite ways to each other. And we just bounce ideas off of each other all day, every day, and that's what. And like we we don't even argue. Like we've never even had an argument. People always say, "Oh, it must be really yeah, hard good. working with your family. Oh, it must be really tough working with that's your brother." Right, and it's like, nah, man, he's yeah. like my best mate. Like, yeah, that's good. We do everything together. We train together. We work together. We eat together. It's just like, it's amazing. Even though we knew the story, it's amazing hearing the story yeah. and how two people, two brothers from you know, yeah, family and it actually obviously worked work. out, man. It it's, actually like worked out, and and no one ever thought it would. Yeah. Even my family never thought it would. And I started the brand on my own, and like it took it took a year for Mike to realize, like shit, like, let's let's fucking yeah. do this. It's mm -hmm. actually gonna we're gonna do something with it, and 
and he's just like I, I always say it but without him there is no represent like it's it's crazy I don't know so would you say in terms of you you said creative director obviously you, you were a bit on the the CEO side of things yeah as well. it's very yeah so would you say that dipping into that side of business takes away from your creative flair yeah 100 percent right a million percent it does but that's how it is and that's how and i, I still en i enjoy that because it's i like learning things and i like getting deep into the business side of things rather than just creating and i only have a few hours a day where i can actually just create mm. and i can get everything out onto a board and get it all out in front of mike and for me to then sit down and actually do it is not I guess it's actually become not in my interest because I'm doing so many other things as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I try not to bring Mike into them kind of things too much because it does play on your mental yeah, yeah. massively. Like, especially if things aren't going right or like there's issues here and there's issues there, I'd rather keep him away from that and let him just, just thrash it out on the design. Yeah, that's a hard place to be because obviously you're carrying a lot of weight. Yeah, shoulders in that aspect, and obviously without the other. But I'll, ha side, I'll happily carry all the weight if he can design, fair. yeah, produce what he does. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, it's nice to share that weight sometime. Right? I assume. I guess yeah, that's I mean, why we speak sometimes. Yeah, like, yeah. Wow. I share it with you. I, I I do a lot of venting to you when I've got I've got a few friends in the business that have been in there for a long time that I share that weight with quite quite regularly. It's necessary. Yeah, yeah and we and we we all thrash it out and we'll shut the door in my fucking room and <laughs> no one else can listen and we'll we'll go at it. But it's that they're the best times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, that creates like a bond, with, especially with your staff. That like I don't know. I think it's like a family bond kind of when you can bring someone into that into that moment and they can enjoy it as well even though it's most of the time it's not actually a great moment to have mm -hmm. but if you can bring them into it well, they feel and important, they can, feel important yeah yeah feel it, part it is, of it's yeah it's feeling part of the family and like i've just set up a represent boot camp where literally all of my staff now are all at the gym three times a week 6 a.m all have the diet plan under your instruction but they love that it's it's, it's, it's your daughter plan your... it's my best my best friend uh, from HR, school yeah <laughs> my best friend from school um is is a personal trainer and health coach and whatever. That's so, good, good. so I just thought one day, like, I I was listening to I was listening to no 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 I was listening to I was listening to a podcast and um they were saying like you uh, the best bond created is when you're working hard together and you're sweating together and like you're actually doing physical activity. So I thought well, we'll try we'll try a boot camp with everyone, see if they if they want to do it and if they want to become more healthy and get fitter and we can all enjoy it together, like during work time mm. like why not try it so yeah that starts next week we'll see how it goes that's good, good well no that that's get, get ready for the p45s thing <laughs> <laughs> no not at all like it, it's an open oh, so it hasn't started yet no it's, oh, it actually start. starts on tuesday oh so that's why you've been hitting the gym hard getting a head start no 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 yeah. not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah yeah i do yeah, that yeah. anyway but <laughs> it's it's just a bit of fun that I, it might yeah. it might bond the staff even more than how they are now because it's like a family in there like no good how so how many staff members you got I'm actually down now too. There you go. It's already started. <laughs> no, that's not because of that. That's because <laughs> I've moved my warehouse to a third party. So yeah. oh, so you outsource all your stuff now? Outsource the warehouse, and just because it's got too much for us, and there's yeah. like wholesale periods where it's really like I can't scale up for such a short time and it's such a big time. So I've moved that out. There's only eleven plus me and Mike. Okay. So um, lean and, operation. and do you know what since yeah since since day one my dad always said to me like don't employ too many people do not like increase your overheads further than you need to yeah. and i always took that on board and i like i, I started working out on my dad's Good shed divorce. and then out of his house out of the garage and then finally got a unit and by that time I, was, I should have been like i had a lot in the bank and we had a lot of stock and we didn't have any overheads apart from well, yeah, apart from stock, literally we we're, were spending money on stock and yeah. that's it. And that's, that's, how, assets, really. that's how the business actually grew because of them wise words from my dad. And even like like going back to doing a runway show, you have, it says when you like sign up for the um, calendar place, it says like how, how many staff do you have? 
between 15 and 30, 30 and whatever now. And I was like, what? Oh, I've got five. Yeah. Like, and people, people look down on you no, as a no, small it's, business. It's a thing, yeah. We're not a small Smallest business. We're no, correct. Yeah. We're, we're, I think that's the, the glory of e-commerce. You can have a small, yeah. small, small staff. Even, you can make a lot yeah, of money. Even, even still people will say like, oh, and how many staffs in there? It's like, oh, I've got 10 staff. I'm like, so it's a small business. And yeah, yeah. Like, no nah, man, you got a hundred staff and I'm. And I'll make more profit than you. I'm, yeah, we're doing way more than you. <laughs> that's 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 the, that's the problem with the world. Everyone sees on appearances. Yeah, and chase turnover, not profit. Yeah, and that's I absolutely follow the same philosophy. If yeah. I can do it myself, and also, I love some of my staff to pieces, and they get along with all yeah. of them. But it's stressful. You're looking after their lives, and that's great, and it's nice responsibility, but. Adding someone else to that team, to that family, you've got to start all over again. It's really, it's actually it's like having a new yeah. girlfriend. When, yeah, sad that. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, adding, adding staff into an environment that's actually really good and like a family, they, it's hard for them, for the new staff to blend in. To blend in, yeah. yeah. But when you get the right people in it, it's great. It's like, and there's it's nothing family. better than seeing someone progress, improve, yeah. be happy, and love exactly. There's nothing better. But at the same time, making everything work with your relationship with them their relationship with the team it's really hard and obviously you're responsible for them at the same time and you and the you are, yeah. it's hard to please everybody and i think keeping it lean is good but then also when you want to scale you need more skills and then hiring people of more senior experience is also a completely different ball game because yeah. they're used to seeing things at a different level if yeah. you're taking someone who's uh worked in the business for 20 years and he's got all this experience and he's seen all these huge corporations he's gonna think what's going on here yeah this but that's also a good thing for you because then you can learn from them in yeah. some cases but in yeah. some cases they can teach you bad habits they can say why are you why are you no doing yeah this? i completely agree with that that's we saw that job. quite a yeah. lot yeah yeah we've seen that quite a lot I, I i've witnessed that i think okay well because they know. get lazy in the big corporations yeah. yeah you've got one person to do affiliates one person to do PR one person to do yeah. Instagram. Yeah. I said no. That's all the same. You person. all do that. <laughs> it's the same. You do person. a lot. Yeah, man. And people try and uh, slander us for it as well. And it's like that's how the business. That's how our brand and probably your brand has grown. Correct. Cause like, because you, you're you like cash? my one of my guys, staff. He he literally has like five job roles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it could be five people's different jobs, but he's amazing at all of them and he does them all. So and it's like, and he takes that skill from forever. Yeah, he's exactly, got it all in the man. bank. And, he's and learned what, that over so much time that it's like, no one could compete with that. So right. why would you give it to someone else? And that, I think as, as a staff member, that's the, that's the beauty in it. If you do one job, you can get replaced in a second. If you do three yeah. jobs or four jobs, that's very hard mm -hmm. for you to fill. So instead of complaining and go, oh, I've got so much to do, your leverage to the, your boss is bigger because he, you know he or she is going to find it very hard to replace you. Yeah. And you can also take that skill set wherever you want. Yeah. So instead of complaining about having so much to do, look at it as like my, my, my weight in this, in this business is much bigger. Yeah. I've got much more of a say and I've got much room to say, boss, I need a pay rise. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because you can't, yeah. she can't. But not only that, if they end up moving on from the brand or going somewhere else they've got the opportunity to become four different job roles Correct. at different brands which can stem into other different job roles so yeah that's the difference between uh, elite and, and non-elite too i think is like wanting to be able to be multiple things and they say don't be a, a jack of all trades but you can be you know maybe not a master of all but you can be very good yeah, at a yeah, lot of things definitely you can't you, you're never going to be a master of all things but you can be very very good at a lot of things and that's what I take. As a young entrepreneur, you have to. Yeah, you've got to be very You have good to, man. You, you have, have to. to. You have to stitch them labels in on day fun. one. And it's fun. You have to pay them invoices on day two, and you have Correct. to go to the post office on day three. But it's right. all. It's it's all take the shoot on day four, and then take the pictures on day five. And oh yeah. If you spend, oh well, I think uh, that's a good place to wrap it up because I don't know how long it's been. It's been quite a long time. We've been there. Sort of hours. <laughs> probably. probably. <laughs> so no, appreciate you coming on, George. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, everyone. It. Thank you. Check out Rest of the Club. Definitely best podcast. None of this. None of this other stuff. It's a really good. <laughs> no, no, no. It got like halfway through. It got really good because it was more like just, it's always the way. It's yeah. always the way. It's always slow starting. So yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. It, thanks George for coming out. As always. Thanks.